In Mark's gospel, virtually every New Testament scholar concurs that Mark's gospel is in three major sections, and I agree with this very much, three major sections. One major section is where Jesus is around Galilee. And on the left side of the screen, and also on your sermon notes, if you go to the app or the website, hillchurchfamily.org, sermon notes, you'll see these images if you can't see too far away. Galilee's in the top northwest part of Israel. This whole time so far, Jesus has been going around Galilee and basically calling out the crowds. That's normal people, like going to hog days. And saying, everybody, listen. It's just the normal crowd, like going fishing. Just the average Joe and Jill. Oh, they're here. Hi, Jill. She's here. She's in the crowd. No, no, on the crowd. So Jill and Joe, they're, uh, they come and he say, hey, everybody, come here. Uh, come here. I want to tell you, about G- uh, tell you about the kingdom of God. And, he's, he's, and of those people, he's gone fishing. He's got the disciples be fishers of men. And some people respond well. And they become intrigued and they listen more and they start adopting his teaching about the kingdom of God. And he teaches them. There are certain people he's called specifically, we call those apostles or disciples, that he says, please get this. I need you 12 people to be the leaders of the big group of disciples going to come in. And so we found so far in the ministry of Galilee, there's been overall a positive response. Overall positive. Uh, There have been some people don't get it. And there's been some enemies of Jesus who have arisen, who come from Jerusalem, and they've set this dark shadow over his ministry as time goes on. We have the story of Herod, who killed off John the baptizer, and he says, oh, man, that's an indication of what's going to happen to people who are fully faithful to Jesus. Well, in just a little bit, we'll see later on, things change a lot. But so far, he's in ministry on Galilee. And this section ends, frankly, pretty sadly, because it is not in the section on a high note. He just doesn't. So in Mark chapter 8, let's start in verse 11. And do you remember this last time at the end of last, uh, right last week? Uh, it's after he feeds the you know, 5,000, the 4,000, and he comes and says, do you still not get it? Do you see what's going on? Um, and he gives them, well, anyway, I, 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 okay. So they feed the 4,000, and then in verse 11, this happens. So we think by this time the disciples, everybody's going to really get it. Jesus is the Messiah. The kingdom of God is being burst in in his life. He can heal people, exercise demons. Here it is. Surely they get it. Verse 11, the Pharisees, these are laity, lay religious people, they came and began to argue with him. That's a good Greek translation, to argue, dispute with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven, and Mark says, to test him. Yeah, Jesus, give us something. Give a sign. And there could be a sign meaning look in the heavens as in, we always call the sky and see if we can read a portend, uh, something that's going to happen, maybe. He could also just mean, come on now, you know, give us something right now to prove who you think you are, who you're saying you are. Come on, do it right now, on right now, right now, to test him. And we can discredit him. If he goes, no, I'm not going to do that. See, everybody, you have no reason to follow this imposter. Later on, by the way, that's exactly what Jews call Jesus. And the Jewish Talmud, he was a magician leading the people astray. That's exactly what they'll charge Jesus of to this day, to this day. So they were trying to test him. In verse 12, and the Greek, he sighed deeply. It's a big exacerbation, but it says in his spirit, this kind of, I can picture him going, count to 10. (laughs) And he said, why does this generation keep looking for a sign? What is it about this people group? Why do you keep looking for something to prove who I am? Why is that? And he left them, getting to the boat again, and he parted, departed to the other side. Departed to the other side. Jesus doesn't rebuke them. He didn't call them names and make fun of them. He doesn't say, you're all going to hell, but he has had it. And so in the narrative so far, every time we meet now these religious leadership, we would hope by now they'd start to click with them. And they don't. It doesn't click at all. And that's what Paul and Mark calls being hard-hearted later on, earlier in the text. And later on, I'll say the same thing about disciples. See, people with, who are hard-hearted, or I, I like the word closed-minded, because that's a, it means the same thing. People who are closed-minded, they test Jesus. They test him. I'm looking for ways to find fault with you. They're captious. They're captious. They want to find fault. And Jesus' point is, why do you seek this? Have you looked at anything I've done for on this ministry? Anything? Have you heard anything about me? Have you seen me do anything at all? Has anything counted? See, what I've done already should count. 
it should be enlisting the proper faith in me because you should have seen enough by now. Remember Mark chapter two? Remember that when Jesus, uh, he's, he's teaching in the house and these friends bring this guy on a pallet, take off the roof and layer him down, lower him down there. And he says, he says uh, your sins are forgiven. Who is this guy? He's blaspheming. What's wrong? What's he, what's he smoking? And he says, to show you the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins, I say, pick up your mat and go home. And what does he do? He picks up his mat and goes home. I, I've shown you signs with your eyeballs that you can see things you can't see, which is I can forgive sins. That's just one of many examples in Mark's narrative. All along the way, I've done enough for you. I've done enough for you. I've done enough for you. Why do you keep seeking the sign? Why do you do that? I have found in my life today, this is exactly still true for a lot of people. A lot of people. I like how Alan Culpepper says it. What more can God do? The deficiency lies not in the historical evidence of the reality and character of God. No, no. But in our willingness to stake our lives on the good news of what God has already done. Now, if you know me whatsoever, and it's okay if you don't, I'm a huge fan. Paul can testify. I'm a huge fan of, of having a reason for our faith. I'm a big fan of I've written books on it. Do, I've done over 500 podcasts. I mean, I've, podcasts, I've got a lot of stuff out there trying to say there are good reasons to believe in Christianity. I'm not the guy that says just have faith, warm fuzzies, and go home and get your Bible and you're fine. I'm big about saying there are reasons to believe this is true. I'm real big on that. Why am I big on that? Because Jesus was. Jesus didn't just walk in the scene and go, believe in me, and he goes home. He's constantly giving evidence after evidence. Da, 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 look here. How many fish were there? He'll say in a second, how many bread? Look at what I've done. When will it be enough? In the early church, they did the same thing. They didn't just say, just believe in Jesus and go home. They said he did this, he did this, he got on the cross, he, we saw, we rose from the dead, we've seen him, we've seen it with the empty tomb, we've been there, we've done that. He has been healing people. We have tons of reasons to believe it. So I'm not against, and nor is Jesus, please listen, Jesus and the early church is not against needing to have reasons to believe this is true. He's against it never, ever, ever being enough. Just not enough. I've heard this a lot, a lot online, because it's a wild, wild west online, right? There's no rules. Unless you're Twitter, I'm kidding. Okay, there are no rules. You can say whatever you want to say all the time, most people. And so the point is, it's wild, wild west. Yeah, and I've heard all kinds of stuff like this. If for God's so real, do it right now. Show up right now. Write Yahweh on the moon. Do you really think if Yahweh on the moon, you'd surrender to Jesus on the spot? You would say, that sure is intriguing. I wonder how the wind pattern got on the moon. What aliens did that? The point is, it's just not enough. Now, there's one kind of person, I uh, one, I mean, there's a kind of person I have such empathy toward, and that's the person who's seeking, who's searching, who's trying to make sure this stuff makes sense. That might be some of you in this room, I hope, I hope. This is still new to you, or you're still on the outside, and hopefully you're paying attention when we read the gospel, and maybe ideally on your own, seriously. You're hopefully at home reading the gospel yourself and going, I want to learn more about this Jesus character. Man, he's really intriguing. He did that, he did that, he did that. Man, I'm really learning. That's fantastic. But if you find yourself being the person who does all that, reads all the gospel, reads all the stuff he's done, done your historical work, read the books, whatever you need, and go, mm -mm, no, no, until he does blank, none of the stuff he's done before counts. See, if a normal friend did that to you, if a normal person in the normal world worked up and said, uh, Diane, we're best friends. We're be oh, we are? Yeah, we're best friends. Hey, you going out tomorrow night? Yeah, I'll come there. Prove it. What do you mean prove it? I'll, you know, I'll see you always. We eat dinner together. No, no, I need some evidence. If every, C.S. Lewis says that right, if every single time your friend demanded evidence of you, you would say, you don't trust me. There comes a point when Elaine and I were first married 100 years ago, Jeff. For the first while, Elaine, hundred, yeah, not as long as y'all. Can you hear me? I'm kidding. <laughs> when we were first married, Elaine would not trust me. We'd go on the road, and I'd say, back the hundred, way before things called cell phones were around, you had to have a map, or I would know where to go. I'd say, it's, it's, it's right. She goes, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I see the map? <laughs> and I would say, why don't you trust me? I do trust you. No, you don't. Yes, I do. No, you don't. Why do you need the map? I just want to see. And that was a common argument for a few months until finally it dawned on her. And I used to say, 
Do you love the Lord Jesus, Elaine? Do you? I'm kidding. I'm to say, what would it take? What would it take? You remember that? What would it take? What more can God do? Some of you in this room don't have evidence of God in your life. Maybe you are a Christian. You gave life to Jesus. And you say, well, my life was transformed. I might have a thing or two that he's done. But in general, you're such a baby Christian, you've not seen him do things in your life. That might be you. To you, I'd say, please don't give up. Please keep going forward. He's going to show more of himself if you'll want to know him. Then there's another group of people in this room. You have seen God at work in your life, and you still have a really hard time trusting him because part of you is still saying, yeah, but. Yeah, yes, he's always taking care of my bills so far. Yeah, but. Yes, he's shown himself to be good. Yeah, but. I think Jesus would go, I'm not sure what else I have to do. Matter of fact, his answer is, I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to give you a sign. If you've not seen it by now, I, the, the problem is not me, Jesus would say. It's not because I'm just going, I don't want to show you anything. The problem is you. And that's the way we do it as generation, aren't we? No matter the generation. So I encourage people, get the work, do the research, find out who he is. And at some point, we have to answer the question, what else can God do? The answer has to be nothing. When, when Elaine chased me for a long time before we started dating and then begged me to marry her, I said, she said, what else do I got to do to get you to marry me? And I said, I give up. I'll do it. <laughs> Verse 14, that's a true story. Verse 14, now when they had forgotten to bring bread, now we're switching. So the, the leadership, bad news. They just don't get it. Oh, no, let's look at the disciples, see if they have a better shot at it. When they had forgotten to bring bread, oh, man, they're like the disciples, bring bread, dog, bring the bread. That's the one thing you got to do that's normal for them to, to have supplies for the people. They had only one loaf with them in the boat. That's not enough to feed a whole group. You didn't bring the supplies. They're not Boy Scouts. You weren't prepared. Thank you, Boy Scout nerds. Any Boy Scout in the nerds room? Be prepared. That's our motto. Verse 15, and he cautioned them saying, take he, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Watch out. And they looked at each other and discussed saying, uh, did you bring the bread? I don't have bread. What leaven? What's he talking about? So now when you realize the disciples are still obtuse, they still don't get it. Verse 17, and being aware of it, Jesus said to them, why do you discuss the fact you have no bread? Don't you get it? What are you arguing about that? I, I'm not talking about bread. I didn't say the bread from Herod. I'm not saying go buy loaves. Don't watch out for them Pharisees. You know, in the marketplace, their bread's horrible. Go get Greta's. That's not at all my point. Why do you, you don't get it? Are your hearts hardened? And I think that's how we're supposed to read that. Are your hearts? I know the Pharisees, I get it. That's sad to me, but you? Are you closed-minded too? Verse 18, having eyes, do you not see? Ears, do you not hear? Do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said, well, 12. And seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said, seven? And he said, don't you get it? Don't you get it? Let me unpack that a little bit. The first part, of course, is be watch out. So the, Jesus is trying to make a first point, which is this so-called leaven of the Pharisees and Herod. We don't know exactly what that means. Leaven obviously is something that, that yeast can, it can call, it calls an effect. Sometimes it's positive in the New Testament, sometimes it's neutral, sometimes it's negative. I think the point here is more negative. It's much more of a hostility. And there I was saying, man, he's kind of, I can see him shaking his head after he talked to the Pharisees. He's sighing, he's going, golly, man. Hey, Peter, James, man, I can't, listen, 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 man. Watch out. Because the influence, that hostility of those outsiders, don't let it affect you, man. Don't be like them. You know what I'm talking about, always demanding more and more. Don't do that. Don't let their need for more influence your understanding of who I am. You get it, right? High five. Right, Pete? Did you bring the bread? I didn't bring, you brought the, you said you were bringing the bread. I didn't bring the bread. Pete, listen. Listen for a second. Don't be like the Pharisees, man. They will influence you. Stop arguing about the bread. 
You should get it by now. And let me pause there real quickly, Christians. It's the same for us today. We, we must not let people who do not know Jesus influence your ability to know Jesus. I've met Christians who go, well, I used to be a Christian. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Why did you stop? I read that book by Sam Harris. I had questions about Christianity, so I went and read Christopher Hitchens. What? Christopher Hitchens? He didn't know anything about Christianity. Well, I had a lot of questions about Christianity, so I went and read a guy who doesn't know anything about it. You know, you know that book. Yeah, that really changed my mind. I watched that YouTube video, and that just did it. Who'd you watch? You know that guy. That guy, he didn't know anything about Christianity. Well, that was enough for me. Why did you do that? Why did you go pursue? Never... You know, Elaine's not real. She's not real? Oh, yeah. Who'd you talk to? Uh, the, this person in China who's never met her. What? Hey, they made some good arguments. They have a lot of followers. You should have seen all the likes. I've met her. Why don't you talk to me? Stop being persuaded. See, that's the thing about it. When you really know a person, their outsider's opinion won't sway you. You'll go, man, I don't know what you're talking about. I would never believe in a God that just does blah, blah, blah. Me neither. High five. They go, what? I, who, are you, who are you talking about? We don't worship that God. Is that what you think? Whew, I'm so glad we met today. You have a few minutes. Let's sit down and chat. I would never marry some eight-foot-tall beast woman who beat you every day. That's what that's Elaine is. What? <laughs> Have you met her? She's nine feet tall. The rest is true. <laughs> She's not eight feet. She's right here. Here she comes all sweet. I'm giving her a hard time because she's here today. In the room, I mean. It's crazy. And that's exactly, it seems to me, Jesus' point. Please don't let, please don't let their viewpoint dictate you disciples, your view. Don't, listen, don't get from there to there. It is a fire that does not need to spread. And I know every mature Christian I know has that sense of, not delusion, it's not delusion, it's a sense of, yeah, I hear all that, but you don't know what my Jesus has done for me. You don't know. I hear all this, and if and the, and the person didn't die, they, they did still die from cancer, and that child did still starve. Yep, I don't have answers for everything, but my God has been good to me. He made a way when there was no way. You don't, let me tell you about a Jesus who makes a way in my life. I can tell you, I can tell you, I can tell you. No, no, I watched that YouTube video. Well, okay, but I know, I know her, or in Jesus' case, I know him, and that won't persuade me a bit. And they're still debating about bread. They're still debating about bread. See, this is scary to me because that means even those on the inside, that's Mark's vocabulary in Mark 3, those about me, those on the inside, you're supposed to get it. He says in Mark 4, to you have been given the secrets of the kingdom of God. To those outside, I speak in parables. And he quotes Isaiah, remember Mark 4? So that they might hear and not perceive, see but not see. That's a judgment on them because they want to stay out there with their arms going, fine, who's that Jesus guy? But when you come on the inside as disciples, then I explain this to you. You're going to get it. And they're going, did you bring bread? I didn't, that was your job. You don't get it? Okay, let's go through this one more time. Do you remember the bread story? Do you remember the thing that just happened? How many fish? They're going, yeah. I don't think the numbers he's replaying to make a big point. The point is, you were there. We still remember it. It's still fresh on our mind. It's still, I mean, what has God been trying to teach you maybe that you just don't see? I mean, would he show up in your life right now? What about right now? I just don't see him at work ever, ever, ever. This is where, in my genuine experience, where I really, really appreciate mature Christians in my life. Because sometimes I'm just so blind to something, or if I'm really struggling, they'll come along and say, but don't you see how God has worked out? You know what I'm talking about, Greta? How God has done, but you don't see that? And all the time, I'm like, no, I don't. Because I'm so hurt, or I'm scared, or I'm so wounded, I just can't see what's right in front of me. And it's that outside perspective that goes, what? Look at how God's doing, da 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 And you go, well, now that you say it, you, you think so really? Yes, I see it. You see what God's been doing all along? In the moment, sometimes we just simply can't. Sometimes, like them, we're going to be in the corner going, oh, did you bring the bread? I bring the bread. He's over going, do you not see? I can take care of all those needs. I don't need you to have bread, but don't you understand who I am? What's God been trying to show us as a people group, as Hill Church? 
Are we like those old wineskins that just have it all figured out and God's going to do it one way and he only has to do it one way and there's only one way to do it and that's the way we've always done it or whatever. We all have to fight that temptation all the time to think that just the way it's been done has to be God's way of doing it. That's just not true. And sometimes us like the disciples can just be right in front of it and miss the whole point. Now, Jesus is frustrated. The first time he's frustrated the leadership, I'm not giving you junk signs. I'm not doing it. And now he's the disciples really letting them have it. Why can't you see what's going on? Why can't you see it? And this ends probably this section of the entire gospel. It ends on a, a dark note, you might say. And then he changes gears. And this next section, he is now basically going to be on his way to Jerusalem. And on the way will be a constant rhythm throughout this text. And on the way is a, a, almost certainly a double entendre, a double meaning. And that is, he's literally on the way to Jerusalem. But it's a metaphor for being on the road of discipleship. And things really change. You'll notice this a lot. For example, the crowd is barely mentioned ever again. The rest of the whole gospel, it's like they've had their chance. Everybody, have, now he did a little bit, he'll do a little bit. Whoever wants to be a disciple, come follow me. he have a few more chances to be a disciple. But in general, the crowds are a thing of the past. I've gone, I've done my ministry. They've had their chance. I've even sent out disciples, two by two. But not everyone's believed. Disciples, they, they keep needing to be re-educated over and over and over in this next section. It's like we just lose hope that they're ever going to get it. I mean, they just, man. There's almost zero power acts. We say the word miracle, but Greek is just a power act. There's almost none of them. Uh, and then, of course, discipleship is this journey. It's on the way. It's on the way. We'll talk more about that later on. It's on the way. So things really do change. So he's going to slowly move from Galilee going down south to Jerusalem toward the cross, toward the cross. So in Mark chapter 8, we'll see the next full part here, okay? Next bit. In verse 22, amen? amen. You with me? Sure it's quiet this morning. They came to Bethsaida. And that's where, of course, some of the disciples are from. And some people brought to him a blind man, and he begged him to touch him. And he begged him to touch him. Please touch me. Please, please, please. And he took the blind man by the hand. I like that. Very gentle. Takes him by the hand. He leads him out of the village. Again, Jesus is not a magician doing this for show. He's being gracious. But And when he had spit on his eyes, What? I didn't say that coming. I'm just kidding. I mean, that's just pretty I'll talk about that in a second. He laid his hands upon him and he asked him, do you see anything? And he looked up and he said, I see men. They look like, like walking trees. They're fuzzy. I see, but I don't see. Then again, he laid his hands on his eyes and he looked intently, looking intently. And he was restored and he saw everything clearly. And he sent him away to his home saying, do, don't even enter the village. Don't do it. Why? Because you go out of the village, you're going to be walking around not blind anymore. They're going to know what's going on. They're going to come out here and say, heal me, heal me, heal me, 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 me. That's not what I want to happen. My ministry is not just a healing ministry. What in the world is going on here? Well, this guy who is blind comes up, of course. I, I said this last week uh, to, I was talking to the, the car about the, uh, the guy before and he's mute and he can't hear, and Jesus touches his ear, and he touches his tongue, touches his, uh, Jesus' tongue, the, the spit, touches, and looks up to heaven. And so, of course, he's trying to basically kind of signing to this guy so we can see God, he's looking at heaven, God's about to heal you. Well, to demonstrate he's going to heal you is this spit, or spittle. So this spit in the ancient world oftentimes was associated with healing. And then my precious wife and daughter said, you didn't say that, you should have said that, that's gross. So I'm saying it this week. So the reason why he probably is going... Versus, versus really letting him have it. It's because he's trying. I can't prove it. I don't think he's. Gonna, this isn't Ace Ventura. But he, that's for you Christians. But he's probably going. The saint, the guy can't. He can hear it. The point is because spittle is associated with healing. I'm going to let this guy know this was about to happen. Now, I would wonder, Bonnie, because he can say, "Hey, hey, buddy, I'm about to heal your eyes." I would think that would work. But probably that's not what, in, the, in this time period, I'm trying to express to you, you're about to be healed. And so spit was probably the, almost like a metaphor for that that's about to happen. But what's something so bizarre is really not being spit on, though that's a little bit weird to me. The most bizarre thing is, is this is the only healing account I know of in the ancient world of a person who said to have had a miracle that didn't happen instantaneous, that it took two steps, two stages. And even the gospels, this never happens besides this one example. 
What's going on here? Why does it take two tries? Is this blindness really, really tough? Maybe. I don't think so. Virtually every New Testament scholar agrees that it is an acted parable. So probably what's going on is Jesus pulls his guy aside. It doesn't say the disciples are with him. I'm assuming they're close by. And he, 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 he goes, he goes, and then he touches the guy's eyes. He goes, do you see anything? I can hear the guy going, well, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of fuzzy. look like trees. And I can hear Jesus look at the disciples and go, so you can kind of see a little bit. So some clarity. And he's going, yeah, why are you screaming at me, Jesus? Do you get it? Let's try again. The second time's the charm. I can just see him do that. And it probably that's exactly what's going on. That the disciples are just like this man. They're half blind. And they won't see clearly until the very end. And the next part of the narrative makes that really clear. The disciples are always obtuse, and then Jesus has a healing story. They're either deaf or they're blind because the disciples can't hear them, they don't understand, or they don't see and they don't understand. And it's not until the end. That's exactly what Jesus says in John 12, 16. Right now, you won't understand this until after. And how true that must have been to look back after the fact and go on, that's why he did that. Now I understand what he was talking about. Three days later, what was he talking about? Now I get it. And some people just don't get it. And that's exactly what the disciples won't get it. You need to understand, he's telling the disciples, I'm convinced of this, it's like this. You're going to kind of understand my ministry, but this is very important. You will not see clearly who I am until after I suffer and die and are raised again. They will not get that message. And he's going to try many times to get them to see this. You won't fully see me clearly until you see me go to the cross. And that's where you should be right beside me, he'll say later on. So that wait and wait and wait. See, it's like that today, it seems to me. See, God's power is not always evident just because I get that job right now. Got that big payday right now. I mean, that's the dream, isn't it? That's the lottery. Overnight, my, bet, my debts are gone. Overnight, everything changes. Overnight, the, the, the illness is gone. Overnight, the marriage is saved. Overnight, I'm never stressed or worried. Overnight, I no longer have anxiety. Overnight, and if God doesn't do it overnight, as it were, in the click of a Thanos hand, that's for you, Paul. If you don't Thanos hand it, it doesn't count, and God's not showing his power. That's just demonstrably false. In Mark chapter 4, he said, the kingdom of God grows. It's like a man who throws seed everywhere, and he goes to sleep, he wakes up, he wakes up, and just grows. He doesn't know how it happens, but it grows over time and gets huge. It's like a mustard seed, the smallest of all seeds, but it grows huge. It takes time. God's rule and God's reign is sometimes instantaneous. Sometimes it's a spit of this and this, and boom, demon goes running. Yep. Other times, the kingdom of God is not like that. It does take time. His rule just starts to sink in more and more and more. And I'm more forgiving now than I was yesterday. I'm more kind today than I was last week. I'm more loving today back. I'm more, I'm more. And over time, what happens, the spirit just shapes us and just gets us all right. And I'm convinced that's Jesus' point by making this miracle in two stages. It's like that. It's like we're all half blind. And some of us can see more clearly than others. Do you see that? Do you get that? Do you get that some people in this room see him better than you do? Do you see how much it hurts you at being half blind to stay away from people who can see better than you? How dangerous that is. It's especially dangerous to think you can see clearly when you can't. That's dangerous, man. When you get real confident and you're ignorant, Ignorance isn't that bad. Confidence isn't that bad, but confident ignorance is bad. A real disciple of Jesus. Try us one more time, Pete. Try one more time, Elaine and Paul. Okay, what do they look like? You can kind of see? Let's do it one more time. Sometimes it takes in between stage. And it's okay for us, it seems to me. I would say good. I am a disciple of Jesus. I am a disciple of Jesus. And I don't seem clearly at all the time. And I'm still a work in progress and I'm still growing, but I guarantee you, I'm with him. I've gone all in with him. I don't see him clearly all the time. I don't fully understand that. And I'm not, not, that mustard bush, I'm not a big one yet, but I'm growing. And I need you who can see better than I can to help me. Come alongside me and help me. 
just earlier, Brandon was talking about Hayden. said, I really think about him and, and think about him and pray for him. I was thinking, man, I needed a Hayden in my life when I was in college. I needed a Hayden in my life when I was in college. I said, amen. I needed someone who come alongside me. What God can do through other people and perhaps what I can do for them to help them see more clearly. But that takes us getting to know each other and not running in, running out of church, getting part of a small group, all those things. And also giving ourselves grace to say, I can't see fully clearly. Will you help me? If we hold hands together, we'll bump into a lot of stuff, but we're going to make it. We're going to make it. We're going to make it. Let's pray together. Ask Lord Jesus in our half-blind state that we would see as clearly as possible what you want us to do. I ask for that capacity, Lord, because we need it. We are full, a lot of us are, maybe not everybody in this room, but a lot of us are surrounded in environments, and maybe it's just on social media. Maybe it's in our, in our own home. We're surrounded by people who are, yeah, yeah, but. If God's so good, yeah, but. And they're demanding a sign repeatedly. Help us, Lord Jesus, help them, but certainly, I guess, first and foremost, help us understand who you really are and, and get enough, <laughs> enough knowledge of what you've done in our lives to know that we have a really good reason to trust you. Trust you. Help us be the people who help other people see it the same way. Lord Jesus, help us not be like the disciples in the corner arguing and fully obtuse, just, just not getting it at all. There's, we confess, there's probably numerous ways in our own lives right now, right now, today, this morning, that you're doing something amazing in our lives and we just don't see it. Maybe because we're so focused on our own selves as narcissists or we're still focused on the worry. We're still focused on what's going to happen, what's going to happen. We're still focused on who hurt us. We're focused on what we didn't get and what I don't like. Maybe, I don't know, God, maybe there's many other reasons why we just don't see what you're doing. Help us see Help us see. And we recognize that sometimes the help that we see for your spirit is partial. It's partial, but it's enough to trust you. So the one day we see you, as Paul says, face to face. We thank you for that, Gabili. In the name of Jesus, we pray. God's people's death. Amen.